folks, welcome back to the channel. And uh, after the feedback from last night, I have a few quick comments to make at the beginning before we get into the interesting part of part two of the making of a Model 3 Man episode. Thank you very much for the feedback on the new Model 3 Man opener sequence. One or two of you did complain that they missed the original music, which had kind of in their mind bonded with my channel. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put up the opener with the new music, followed immediately by the old music. And you can vote in the comments below. Tell me which one you prefer. Generally, though, from the appearance of the opener, you loved it. And, I, and thank you for your feedback on that. Number two. Hmm. Somebody commented, can you not put a list of the links to the equipment that you use? And I'm very, very sorry I forgot to do that. It was late last night. I have done that, but I'm going to do one better. After I've posted this video, which means when you're seeing it, I'm going to put actual links to where it could be purchased but more importantly if a newer version has come out since i got the equipment it'll be linking to that newer version or if the old one is the only one then that will be the link so i'll put full links in the description of both this video and the first one part one as well number three. Oh yeah i realized after i was reviewing all of the equipment that I have in my channel that I don't use a heck of a lot of the items that I listed. In the list I've put three stars, three asterisks, against the equipment I use all the time. But I'll tell you right away what they are. One, the phone. Two, the tall tripod that's standing right there with my phone on top of it. Three, the little lavalier mic, the iRig lavalier mic. I use it all the time. Number four, the two lights. I'm sitting staring at one and the other, and they're called soft boxes. Uh, as I said, they were less than $80 each. That's Canadian. The other two items I use is the strip lining behind me and the colored lights above my head. Those are not essential. What is essential is the phone, the tripod, and the lavalier mic. And with that, and a video editing program, you can do everything. Oh, yes. There was one piece of equipment came out in active rebuke against me after yesterday's video upload. Something like, what? After all I've done for you? After all the video footage I've gained and the trouble I went to and the heights that I went to to do it, I don't even get a mansion? All the other DJI products got a mansion, and I don't? Of course, that was my drone. How I forgot this fellow, I will never know, but I think it was in the cupboard, kind of hidden away. This is my most beloved accessory, but it isn't cheap, and I don't use it all the time. But the DJI Phantom 4 Pro drone is a fantastic performer. I get a lot of footage from this. Uh, if you have not seen and the flyover that I did to the Tesla factory down at Fremont, go and take a look at that. I'll try and put the link up here. That is footage gained from my drone. So that's it. Sorry about that, it won't happen again, I'm going to use you soon. Today, we're going to look at the magic that happens after we have recorded an episode. And I'll be talking about a few things. Let me quickly list them here. One, the software I use on the phone. That is a critical part of the equation. You cannot think that you can use the Apple software, the Apple camera app, and do a good job. So we're going to look at Filmic Pro. Number two, we're going to look at how I get that video into my Mac. It happens to be a Mac. If you have a PC, it would be a slightly different procedure. But how do I get the footage I've captured into the Mac for editing? And number three, what do I do to it in Final Cut? And look, this could be a hugely open-ended. And Jillian said to me this morning, Dad, don't go deep into the woods about every little thing you do in Final Cut. You'll lose everyone. But, but I do believe that I can show you a before and after, and I can say, here's how it looks as we bring it in. Here's how it looks now. This is 
basically what I did to it. And I think that would be of interest to everyone. So folks, stick around. Let me give you a quick overview of the Filmic Pro app as it regards to setting up for a shoot. Uh, the cog over here gives you a lot of settings. So resolution, frame rate, which audio. Right now we're using the headset microphone. That of course means the iRig lavalier that we've been talking about. So effectively, if it were not on a tripod, I could add stabilization, but it's on a tripod, there is no movement, I don't worry about that. Camera gives you the choice of the telephoto lens or the wide angle lens. Resolution, you can see we're shooting at 4K. I always shoot at 4K because I can always downsample or I can zoom into it on an HD timeline and get a real benefit. Now look at the levels of quality above the regular Apple standard. So Apple standard, no, we don't want that. We can go to filmic quality, but better, we can go to filmic extreme. That is why the video file is so large. Eight minutes, close to eight gigabytes. So I've got the right resolution and the right quality. All of the other settings are good. We are recording on my external lavalier. Now we come down to color and log mode. So right now, it's put it on automatic white balance. Now I could change things as you can see I can push up toward the yellows I can push down toward the green or the magenta uh, it doesn't make much sense automatic white balance Filmic Pro will pick up what it considers to be correct but what if I wanted to actually hold that value during filming I just tap on that turning it red white balance is locked now if we used normal we'd get that picture if we used log mode we get a much flatter, blander picture, but that's much better for editing. Look at the difference. Log, flat, bland. Normal, very high contrast. But the flat, bland log mode gives us a much greater ability to color grade and to fix exposure issues. It effectively captures at a wider dynamic range. We can change the exposure. I like to keep my shutter speed to a multiple of the frame rate that we're using. So if we're using 30 frames per second, in fact, we should be picking 1 60th of a second. And I can lock it there, put it about there. I've locked the shutter speed to 1 60th and my ISO is 24. That's tremendous. That means Low ISO equals low digital noise. That's very really important. And my ISO on 24 indicates I will have virtually no digital noise at all. So I think we're ready. We've locked the white balance. We have it on log mode. We've got the exposure set to 1 60th of a second and lock that. We've got the overall exposure looking about correct. And of course, all the settings in here have been done. One last thing remains my microphone. If I push it up, the volume increases. If I bring it down, the volume decreases. And I actually want to set the volume at a relatively low setting so that I do not get distortion. And that's it. We're now ready to hit the button and begin filming. We're sitting at the desk of my iMac and I have connected the phone with a regular USB cable to the back of the iMac. And I'm going to bring in the clips from the phone. And the way that I find easiest is to use this little piece of software called Image Capture. And you say, well, where is that? There we go. So if we go into the Applications folder right there, there it is, Image Capture app, Image Capture. You can drag that down to the dock, and it'll be there forever. And go down to the dock, click on Image Capture, and this comes up. And there you can see there's two clips that have me sitting at my desk with the guitars behind me. 436 meg, 8.1 gigabyte. You say, how long is that one? Well, it's only eight minutes. What I wanted to point out to you that when you record at high resolution and we're using the Filmic Pro app, it's a large file. 
but it needs to be. It needs to contain all of the color information. Down at the bottom here, we make sure that we're putting it into the right folder, and that's the folder that I prepared for the file. And then all we've got to do is click on import. And that particular file up there will be the one that's imported. Now, since I've done that already, we're not going to worry. I'm going to close image capture. I'm going to go into Final Cut Pro. And you can see that in the events column on the left, I have model three man part two, the making of an upload. There is the import button, import media from a device. Well, there really is a much easier way to do it. If you have your file in Finder and it's in the location you want it to be and to stay, take it, drag it, move it across, and drop it. And there it is. Now I'm going to drag this down onto the timeline. And I'm not going to work on this one right now. What I want to do is go back and show you clips from previous uploads where I've already done all the work. And that'll make it easier and quicker for me simply to show you things that I did that improved and changed the raw footage. Okay, folks, I've gone back to an old episode that dealt with the Traffic Aware Cruise Control. But we're not looking at the timeline as a whole. So here is some of the content on the timeline. We're not looking at that. I've got a clip here, which I've duplicated there. Look at the difference. That compared to that. So here is the clip as it appeared originally. So there's the clip. On the right are all of the effects, both color and sound and general video clip effects that we could be applying. Over here, we've got the option of changing the speed of the clip, but I'm more interested in the appearance of the clip, cropping it, transforming it, or distorting it. So I'm gonna go first onto the distortion of the clip. I've reduced the size to 100% instead of fit. The reason I've done this is bringing it down to 100 allows me to see the handles that get created when I click on a, on a tool. I click on distort, and there are these little blue boxes in the corners that allow me to actually move them. Now I know that my phone, at the angle it was recording, has tended to slope things outwards in the direction of my mouse. And you can see it over there that the air vent appears to be slanting off to the right on that side as well. This guitar appears to be tilted a little toward the right, and this one a little toward the left. So if I choose to bring that handle in, now my acoustic guitar, the Evasion Adamus over here, appears to be straighter. I'm going to do the same from the left side, and you can see that the air vent also appears to be vertical on both sides. Move it a little bit more there, move this a little bit more, and then because I want it to be the original wood, I'm going to grab these side handles, and there you saw it snap to the edge of the picture area, move left, it snaps. Good. Now I know that I haven't made myself look artificially thinner. So I'm going to say done on the distortion, and I'm going to go instead to transform. And now I can see that the shape of the picture has little tiny black triangles in the corners. Well, that's because we distorted the video. All I've got to do is to enlarge it. First of all, I could look at the rotation and I could twist it round to make sure that everything is straight. I think that looks about right, like that. And then after I've rotated it, I'm simply going to go across to the right and use the scale slider and enlarge. And now you can see that there are no longer little black triangles in the top corner. Let me bring it back so you can check that. There, you see, you can see them. Now you cannot. Well, how big should I make it? Well, that's up to me. I'll push the picture up or down. I choose to keep the top of the bass guitar just in the picture. That's that guitar growing out of my head. And so I think that's it. I'm going to hit the word done, and then I'm going to bring it back up to a fit in view. That just makes it as large as the available space you have. Okay, so we've fixed it 
from a perspective standpoint. We haven't fixed it from a color standpoint. So I'm going to go across here and up at the top, that was the video clip. And on the right is color inspector. Now I can choose either to have color wheels or the color board, which has a different set of tools. I prefer the color wheels. On the master control, we can bring down the exposure or push up the exposure. I choose to leave it in the middle where it is for now. Uh, we could change the color if we dragged in the, in the center of it, but we're going to double click to restore it to where it was. We could change the saturation if we pushed this up and down. I'll double click, it returns it to the neutral position. Now, if you look on the left hand side here, and I'm just going to enlarge this area, you can see that we've got some kind of weird graphic. And what this displays is the brightest point, the darkest point, and where the picture lies. And we can see that it lies very much in between the darkest zero and the brightest 100. Most of the picture lies within there. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to go up to the right hand side. I'm going to work on the exposure of the shadows. You can see if I pull it down, that little weird graphic we were looking at moves. Well, I'm going to bring it down until it just touches zero, because we should not really go below that. Now I'm going to go to the highlights, which are the bright areas. If I pushed it up too high, we would overexpose the picture horribly. It should not go above 100. So. I know that there are some faint ghost-like lines on the side, so if I push that up, it would mean that certain points are at full exposure. You can look at the trim light on the bottom behind my back, it's overexposed. So we're going to bring it back down again to about there, but now I'm going to move to the mid-tones, and here we can pull it down or up, and it doesn't change the darkest or lightest points, it moves everything in between. So if I pull that down to there, then I'm looking at my face and I'm seeing that it looks relatively well exposed. The picture looks like I expect it to look. How did it look? Well, it's turn off and turn on the effects I've just been playing with. How about saturation? Yep, we can push overall saturation up but that looks terrible, or that looks terrible too. What about just a little? Yeah, we could. We could increase the color saturation. I tend to think that it's pushing my skin tones to look too rich. So I could push the shadows up a little. The highlights, I could bring saturation down very slightly. I'm going to check the before and the after, and I'm happy with that. So that's how I would basically set about doing the color grading, and that's the difference between what it was before and what it is now. And of course, I could copy those settings to another clip. So I could go to this clip, and let's reset everything, edit, remove effects, and there, that clip looks bland and awful compared to what we've just been doing. So if I go to the clip we were on, I'm just going to enlarge it here. I'm going to press Command C, which copies everything I've done to that clip. Now I'm going to move to this clip, and uh, this is the one that is looking in need of some work. And I'm going to press Command Shift V. And you can see up here that there's a whole lot of attributes and adjustments that I made that are going to be pasted to the second clip. You can see down here that the audio level is softer. Audio level here was better because I'd fixed it. Let's go to paste. And instantly, both of these clips now look... Let's do that. Both of these clips look identical because I pasted the effects from that guy onto this guy. That's an unflattering picture. There we go. 
that's how I typically color grade my incoming video. Uh, of course, audio is a secondary adjustment, and I'm going to go through that very quickly. Let's again take this back down to basics. Edit, remove effects. Once again, I'm going to copy from that clip. This time, I'm only going to paste the video effects. I'm going to turn off the audio. So I'm not pasting the audio attributes or effects. I'm pasting the video. Let's go paste. There we go. So now you can see, I'll zoom right in over here, that on this clip, the audio looks good. This line, which says minus 9 dB, I have some peaks going a little above it, and that's fine. But this is very soft. In other words, my incoming audio was very, very soft. Let's click on the one that we did adjust. I'm going to scroll back a little bit. I'm going to go across to the top right-hand corner, and you can see that we were playing with Color Inspector. Let's show the Audio Inspector. And this demonstrates that I actually had applied some EQ, some compression, and some gain. And so what I'm going to do is make this a little smaller so we can see our entire screen. And I was looking, of course, at the clip that had been adjusted. Let's go and have a look at what we did to the audio. Let's go up to Equalization or EQ. Um, you can see here that this is a typical graphic equalizer. These are the high sounds. These are the deep sounds. Well, no voice has anything like a kick drum or frequencies quite that low. But you can see this has a particular shape to it. If I move my mouse and I go through all of the points, you can see that it rises a little bit on some of the bass area, but then it takes a dip. And then it comes up again. So you can see that what I'm doing is emphasizing the high end of my voice, dropping the mid-tones, and this is the part where you actually have harsh, unpleasant sound. And then I'm treating the bass with a little bit of a bump there, but it's still below the zero line. Now, you will move these adjustment sliders so that you fix problems with your mic. My little iRig lavalier mic is not a perfect mic. And so what I'm doing is reducing the unpleasant characteristics and increasing those that are good. So the higher end, the sharper end, I keep it up high. The middle or muddy middle, I bring down and the bass I have slightly elevated above the mid-tones. So that's the equalization. Compression is a feature, and you'll see it as I play. Let me just let this clip run, and you can see a little bit of compression kicking in. So what I need to do is explain what that means. If you have audio where your loud sounds are very loud and your soft sounds are too soft, if you apply compression, you bring up the level of the soft parts and you keep the level of the high parts suppressed and therefore a sound is more even. So that's a little bit technical, but I use compression to even out the audio. And then the gain, here on the right, bring the gain next to that. You can see I raised it to plus 14 dB. And the reason for that is the audio down here you can see how soft it is. So by using this gain preset, I can bring it up and bring it up to an appropriate level. So I'm going to close that. I'm going to let this clip play. I'm going to show you the audio levels over here. So I'm going to start the clip playing. Lots and lots of ideas for new tips of the day. And you'll see that it peaks up to about a top end of minus six. Typically, I like to keep it on about minus six. I don't like to go above, and that allows for a lot of headroom, and it guarantees no distortion. So I basically add more gain until the levels peak at about negative six dB. So we've come to the end of this episode. I want to thank you for indulging me in showing you how I use my tools, my equipment, my accessories, and some of the techniques that I use into Final Cut Pro. 
We'll be back on to tip of the week tomorrow. We took a break today because Monday's Easter Monday and I uploaded this video. And then from tomorrow, we'll continue with the tip of the day series. So thanks once again for watching. Cheers for now, folks.